Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnana Jnana Shalakaya Chakshurun Yilitam Yena Tasma Shri Gurave Namaha The Nectar of Devotion Yeah, this book, The Nectar of Devotion, was one of the first books that Srila Prabhupada prepared uh, after coming to the Western countries. It's one of Srila Prabhupada's first books. Srila Prabhupada has subtitled it The Complete Science of Bhakti Yoga. Science, we expect in science analysis. Well, there are two main phases of science. There's uh, theoretical and practical. Mm. Just like we have pure mathematics and applied mathematics. At least that's what they called it when I was at school. I don't know what they call it nowadays. And there's theoretical physics and practical application. So the two are intimately related. In the Nectar of Devotion, which is a summary study of Srila Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which means the same thing. It's a bit of a longer title. The, the Ocean of the Nectar of Bhakti Ras. So we have both. We have what we might call theoretical or analytical. Specifically is analyzed the qualities of Krishna and Bhakti. The subject is Bhakti Rasa. The qualities of Krishna, they give rise to feelings for Krishna. So there's discussion of Krishna's pastimes in an analytical manner. We're just showing how different, and in an anecdotal manner, we can say, which means small little extracts, which are quoted to, uh, they're quoted as examples of uh, typical themes within Krishna's pastimes which give rise to various feelings among devotees. There's also a practical instruction how to practice devotional service. Srila Prabhupada said that this book is the handbook or the guidebook for all devotees. So it's a very important book. Now what's the point of bhakti. You have all come here for the sake of performing bhakti. The point of bhakti is Krishna. Krishna is the object of preem. Everyone's love should be directed toward Krishna. Krishna should be the central object. Krishna should be the object of our love this is the central point of Krishna consciousness. This is a quote from Srila Prabhupada. And the devotees, so yeah, so Krishna is called the Vishaya of praying, the subject of praying. And devotees, especially Srimati Radharani, who is the topmost devotee, they are the Ashraya of praying. In other words, praying is in them. Love for Krishna is in devotees. So what, why love Krishna? There are so many other people, Krishna is a person, why love Krishna? Well, why love anyone? We love someone because of their qualities, isn't it? There are various qualities. Mostly people are concerned with good looks. That's also a quality, especially in the modern age. In India also, they're very much concerned with good looks. There's beauty parlors and gyms and all kinds of things to try and make your bag of flesh 
look more attractive. So that's also a quality, but uh, you, you couldn't actually love someone if they're very physically good looking, but they're absolutely horrible in their behavior. The two things often go together, actually. People who are very good looking, they're often, uh, not, not always, but they often uh, exploit that. Also, please don't use the Bhagavad Gita to lean on, to write. Please remember, these are Shastras to be worshipped. So, uh, what is it about Krishna that makes him so attractive? His very name means attractive, his qualities. So, in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Srila Rupa Goswami lists 64 qualities of Krishna. Krishna has unlimited qualities, of which 64 principal qualities are listed. So, I'm not going to discuss them all now. But we can go through a few of them. And in this way, we'll hope to increase our appreciation of Krishna. Because that's what bhakti is ultimately, our appreciation of Krishna. Appreciation develops into service. Service by service we interact with Krishna and he reciprocates with us and then we gain more appreciation and then we directly experience Krishna's qualities, his kindness in our lives. So what are the qualities which make Krishna so attractive? Well, the first thing is when we come in contact with someone, is that we see them. Now you may hear about them first, but actual hearing about them, you, you get some idea. But when we see a person, then you get a more clear idea. What do they look like? Or if you hear about someone, you want to know what do they look like. Nowadays, photographs uh, part of modern life and mass production of paintings so that everyone can have paintings in their home but previously uh, painting was only for very important people or maybe for some very, they would paint some beautiful woman and the person who's getting their portrait painted They'd have to be very patient because they'd have to sit more or less in the same position for a long time while the artist painted them. We have many paintings of Krishna and descriptions of Krishna. Now it's said that first impressions are lasting. So the first thing is we see Krishna. And the first impression that anyone gets upon seeing Krishna is that he's extraordinarily beautiful. Interestingly, uh, many people in the Western countries, when they see the picture of Krishna, they often think, is he a man or a woman? Because Krishna's beauty is such that uh, He's very delicate. Even though he's very strong, he's very uh, delicate. And, and, and beauty, that's usually, a, we usually think of that as a feminine feature. Whereas the male feature is more like tough and strong. Once some of Srila Prabhupada's disciples painted a picture of Krishna looking you know, very muscular and... and uh, in the modern concept of what a man should look like, this, like this Rambo or something like this. Actually, there's one very pop. There are two very popular pictures of Radha and Krishna, which are widely circulated. They're the most popular in Iskon nowadays, and they are both painted after Srila Prabhupada's disappearance. And personally, I don't like either of them. 
because one of them, they call, in Bombay, they, people come up and ask, do you have that filmy picture? Because that's what Krishna looks like, you know, like this. And this one also. Well, it's a it's a beautiful picture, but I. It's very intimate, and Srila Prabhupada generally had us had his artists paint pictures of Radha and Krishna in a more formal pose, rather than very intimate. It's not meant for showing here and there to everyone. This one that's on the wall here. Anyway, once one of Srila Prabhupada's disciples painted a picture of Krishna looking like one of these guys who go to the gym, all muscular. And Prabhupada said, no, this is, the, this is the meat eater's conception of beauty. And Srila Prabhupada showed a print from Bridge Bassi prints or something like that, from India, uh, which showing baby Krishna looking a little fatty. Prabhupada said, this is the milk drinker's concept of beauty. <laughs> so... Krishna looks very beautiful. He is not um, to look very beautiful, but he is very beautiful. The first, yeah, the first quality of Krishna mentioned. Suram Yanga, beautiful bodily features, beautiful limbs. Which means a beautiful, his form is very beautiful. Now this immediately, uh, immediately uh, negates the Mayavad concept. Krishna's form is Satchit Ananda Vigraha. Now this term Satchit Ananda is very popular among the Mayavadis. <laughs> Those who say that the Absolute has, the first thing they say is no form. And no form means no qualities, no pastimes, no personality. So they specifically deny the form. Nirakarvadi, no form. But Rupa Goswami lists the first quality of Krishna as Suramyanga, beautiful limbs, beautiful bodily features. So they say Satchidananda, but there's eternal, blissful and knowledge, but there's nothing there's nothing blissful to there's nothing to be blissful about. <laughs> there's there's no if we say Ananda, what's the Ananda? There's no, it's just, it's non-specific. But we know Krishna as Satidananda Vigraha. Yang Shyama Sundaram Achintya Guna Swarupa. His transcendental form is specifically blackish. That means it's there's a quality there. Blackish and very beautiful and uh, composed of inconceivable qualities. When we say Krishna's form is black, that doesn't mean exactly the black of this world. Just like you see Negroes, they are black. But Krishna's blackness is not exactly like that. It's not any color that we can imagine with our material concepts. It's completely transcendental. The spiritual world Everything is of a different quality to that of this material world. But some uh, examples are different. Just like we we say Krishna has lotus feet. They're, they're compared to the lotus. The lotus eyes. Lotus face. Lotus hands. The comparison is given because the lotus is considered very beautiful. But Krishna is actually much more beautiful than any lotus or anything. So, uh, uh, the color of Krishna that is described as uh, Navameg Hasham, blackish like a new cloud. But again, it's, it's just an example to give. The Krishna is the source of all beauty. He is more beautiful than anything or anyone. And whatever beauty we may perceive, that is only uh, coming from Krishna. Krishna is the source of all beauty. So the Mayavadis, they say Satchidananda, there's just some vague concept of eternity, bliss and knowledge. But we know that Satchidananda is Krishna, that eternity, bliss and knowledge, that means Krishna. 
and specifically his bodily features are very beautiful. Why should he not be beautiful? <laughs> People as they spend so much energy and so much concern with making their bodies beautiful. Often we go into someone's house, we go in the bathroom and we find there's like you know, 50 kinds of soap and 25 kinds of shampoo and 60 kinds of nail polish and all, all kinds of cosmetics just to try and make the body beautiful. So however beautiful you may try to make the body cannot even slightly compare to the beauty of Krishna. So there's no real point in trying. <laughs> Better just to worship Krishna. And the devotees also become beautiful by worshipping Krishna. Devotees are very beautiful. Even if they're not candidates for winning a beauty contest, they're very beautiful because their heart is clean and reflects the beauty of Krishna. The, the, beautiful, the, the, the beautiful purity of Krishna. So Krishna has a very pleasing bodily features. Every part of his body is perfect. It's not, sometimes you might see someone who has a very beautiful face but then their body is kind of messed up or screwed up or, or uh, they have a very nice body but their face is a mess. And, but every, every part of Krishna's body is incomparably beautiful. Perfect. What is the concept of beauty? That in different cultures and in different ages that may change. But the paragon or the exemplar of beauty eternally is the form of Krishna. So very beautiful. Why should God not be beautiful? The, the certain religious systems, they deny that God has any form. Probably seeing the forms of this world, they think, well, why should he have any form? Yes some useless form. But Krishna's form is not like the forms of this world. Uh, in the Sistine Chapel in Rome, there's a painting by Michelangelo of God, looking like a very old man, because he's very he's the oldest person. He has a long beard. and looks, It looks all wrinkled with white hair, but this is a misconception. Krishna never grows old. He's always very beautiful. He's not subject to the influence of time. There are many descriptions of Krishna's beautiful form. Maybe I'll get back to that later, which means a few lectures later. You won't hear all of this. You can download it from the internet if you like. Uh, because that's a general description. Krishna has beautiful bodily features. Suram Yanga. Then the next one is that he has, uh, it's, it's similar, a little, uh, again talking about his body, Sarva Sal Lakshana Anvita, which Srila Prabhupada translates as auspicious characteristics. Now this is similar, isn't it? We're talking about his body has all auspicious features and it's beautiful. Because if someone has auspicious features of his body, that wouldn't be like... Uh, that wouldn't be something not beautiful. Someone might have uh, some growth on their face or a bent nose or something like that. Well, that wouldn't be considered very auspicious. This is the this, this science of physiognomy. I don't know what the Hindi for that is. This must be uh, anyway. I won't speculate what that means. But anyway, it's uh, understood that by seeing a person, one can understand certain things about them. There, there's a science in one of the Puranas. It's described that if one's 
eyebrows are joined together and it's very bushy then this indicates something not very good I can't remember what it is because I didn't study it <laughs> uh, there are very by, there are certain characteristics that one is awarded by material nature which indicates something which he's carrying from a previous life So Krishna has all auspicious characteristics. That means everything about him is good. Now, it's not described here in the nature of devotion, but it is described elsewhere. What are auspicious bodily characteristics? So I'm going to read it from here. Pancha uh, dirga, pancha sukshma. Yeah, pancha dhirga, pancha, pancha sukshma. Five parts are dhirga, which means long or large. They are the nose, the uh, this description of Krishna. The arms, very long arms. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu are described as Ajanu Lambita Bhuj. Their arms stretch down to their knees. So very long arms, a long, ch- a large chin, long eyes. If one lives, the eyes are very long, like this looks very beautiful. There are some names of... Well, there's a, one famous name in South, in South India is, is that temple of Meenakshi, which means fish eyes. Yeah. It means shaped like a, like a fish, tapering like this. Another name for Radharani... Actually, Meenakshi means Radharani, but it can be given to anyone else also. The wife of Sundaresha, of Lord Shiva, is also very beautiful. She's an expansion of Radharani. So another name is Mrigakshi, which means, another name for Radha, which means eyes like a deer. So very long eyes. And knees. Then Panchasukshma, fine the five fine parts are the skin. If someone has very rough skin, that's not considered very nice. It should be, it should be very smooth and fine and soft. The fingertips are very fine. The teeth, the hair on the body, not that it's like a scrubbing brush, should be very soft. It's very fine, that's auspicious. And the hair on the head, just like they have this shampoo, it says will give you silky hair. Well, Krishna's hair is automatically very fine. Then, Saptarakta. There are seven parts of Krishna's body, or any auspicious body, which are red. The red parts are the eyes, the soles of the feet, the palms of the hand, this is often uh, on auspicious ceremonies. The ladies they apply mehindi to their arm, their, their hands, and their feet. And it used to be that uh, in Hindu culture, every lady would apply this altar. Nowadays they're modern, so they don't do it because they're more advanced rascals. They think more advanced means to give up the auspicious culture. Then the palate, the nails, and the upper and lower lips, they're all reddish. Then, Shard Unata, six raised parts, the chest, Krishna has a very high, big chest. So, a little bit like the... uh, Bodybuilders also. Shoulders. Nails. Nose. Waist. And mouth. 
Then three harasva, three small parts, the neck, the thighs, and the organ, male organ, the linga. Then prit, uh, also under three, three hasva pritu gambhiro. So three broad parts are the waist, the forehead, and the chest. And the three grave parts are the navel, the voice, deep voice. Gambhira sounds, sounds very serious. And his very existence, Krishna, characteristic that we can see of someone just by seeing them if they're very grave. They're not a light person. So these are the auspicious characteristics of Krishna, Krishna's form. Then Ruchira, which this means uh, very pleasing. When we see Krishna, we become very pleased. Of course, demons, they become not pleased, but that, that's because they're demons. Everything about them is opposite. But Krishna is naturally very pleasing. Everything about him is pleasing. Everything about Krishna. There's the uh, song by Vallabhacharya that every, how everything about Krishna is very sweet. So this is the essence of Godhead. Mostly people they consider the power, the might, the glory. That is the essence of Godhead. But in the Vaishnava understanding, of course, it's recognized his power, his might, his glory. We have to submit to him. But in Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is stated that Madhurja Bhagavatasa the essence of the godliness of God, what makes him God, is that his sweetness. He is the sweetest person. So this is how we recognize. Someone may be very powerful. All right, someone has to be all powerful. And definitely we bow down to the Supreme Lord. But over and above and beyond that, his sweetness. This is completely missing in the Western religious systems, the uh, approach to, or it's missing, or it's only, uh, it, it's only appreciated by a few, but in bhakti, you don't, it's not that one has to be on a very high level, but from the very beginning one is attracted to Krishna by his sweetness. The, the very enterprise or endeavor in bhakti is to appreciate the sweetness of Krishna. So Krishna is very sweet. And Vallabhacharya has made that song, Adhurang, Adharang Madhurang, his, lip, his lips are very sweet, his gopis are very sweet, his creation is very sweet, his yamuna is very sweet, his flute is very sweet. Madhuradhi Pater Akilam Madhuram. Everything about him is very, very sweet. So Krishna is very pleasing. Sweetness is pleasing. Of course, some people, they prefer hot chili peppers. Uh, some people like to go to movies in which people are killing each other and there's blood all over the place. Well, that rasa is also there in Krishna. Krishna is also on the battlefield and killing others. But that's also sweet. There's also sweetness there. When Krishna kills others, that's also very sweet. Whereas in this material world, even the apparent sweetness, that always turns to bitterness. The example is given that... Uh, well, there are many examples. The, the, the beauty of a young woman looks very sweet and very nice, but it only lasts a short time. And the pleasure that one can have in association 
with young women, that is considered the the uh, highest material pleasure, but that always turns to disappointment. There are always so many complications. Whereas Krishna's sweetness is all auspicious. And Krishna is all pleasing, but that pleasing, it's not the pleasingness or the pleasantness of something in this material world which is ephemeral, means it, it lasts a very short time, just like any sense pleasure that is uh, pleasing just very briefly. You taste some food and then that's it. It's gone. It's on your tongue for a few seconds, then it's gone. And then you have to digest it. That may be a problem. <laughs> but Krishna is not only pleasing, but all auspicious. So the, the pleasingness of Krishna just goes on increasing, and that is the... the pleasantness or the pleasure that we experience in Krishna, that doesn't have any bad side effects. You may like to eat some nice food. I like to eat lots of sweets and then I got diabetes. Or I like to smoke cigarettes and then I got lung cancer. But with Krishna, not only are there no side effects, but by appreciating Krishna, Everything becomes good in the best sense of the term and is all auspicious in all respects eternally. Of course, because this material world acts in a different way, this whole material world is constituted for the sake of forgetting Krishna, we might find that we have some, we have some more problems after taking to Krishna consciousness. We might find that... Uh, our family members don't like us. Or uh, our material, pros uh, material situation becomes quite complex. We might find that. This is, of course, a test from Krishna to see if we are serious to serve him. Because as long as we are trying to increase our ma material situation, the prospects of the so-called happiness in this material situation, then we cannot come to Krishna. Krishna says, Savadhaman parityaja mame kam sharanam braja. We have to choose. Do we want Krishna? Or we don't want Krishna? If we want Krishna, then we can't have uh, the pleasure of this material world. And even if we don't want Krishna, we still can't have the pleasure of this material world because there is no pleasure anyway. It's just, a, it's just an illusion. It doesn't exist. But the endeavor to have that pleasure, even though it doesn't exist, is uh, it blocks our possibility of attaining the real pleasure, which is in serving Krishna. So Krishna is Ruchir, very pleasing. Everything about him is very pleasing. He's also Tejasa Yukta. So Teja, you all know this word, I suppose, Tejas. It means a light, effulgence, or power, particularly the kind of power by which Anyway, we'll, we'll discuss that. Then. So, yeah, it means light or, or uh, influence. So, Krishna's bodily form is effulgent. It's automatically bright. And that brightness, uh, that gives light to the whole to everything. <laughs> Krishna is the source of all light. Sometimes we see pictures, they, they paint a, a halo. Around. You know this halo? They put, in the Western world they put this some kind of effulgence around. Well, aura is for the whole body. 
And a halo means specifically the yellow circle around the around the head which is painted around Jesus and different saints like that to show that they're holy. So Krishna has natural brightness to his body. We see that also sometimes. Well, we'll see that generally in in uh, young people who are very he- or very healthy people, they have some kind of luster. There's an English word, luster. Uh, and there's another kind of luster altogether that saintly people have, which it is a luster of of purity. So Krishna is very effulgent, and and so that there's not with with uh, saintly people we may see there's some it's almost like they're shining, isn't it? The body's shining. Well, with Krishna's form, it actually d- it does shine. That's why when Krishna was in his childhood, he was stealing butter, and the gopis would complain to. Yashoda Mai, that your son is stealing the butter, so you better take the gems off his body, because the gems, they also have some luster. They have their own natural light. So, because we keep the butter stored in the dark cellar, in the dark room, but Krishna comes in and by his gems, the whole room becomes light. But then actually, even if you take off the gems, then he himself is so bright, that he gives brightness to everything. (laughs) <laughs> so that's one meaning of teja. Another is that of energy or power. So Krishna, even though he, he looks very delicate and beautiful, he's also very powerful. Shouldn't be underestimated. Just like Putana, when she came to see Krishna, she came with the purpose of killing Krishna. And although he looked he was just a, a, a young baby but she could just by looking at him she could understand that although he's a young baby he has the power to destroy all the universes he's so powerful she understood this so Krishna should not be underestimated because he looks uh, very delicate but he's very powerful at the same time both things these may seem incongruent. Then how can someone look very delicate and at the same time be very powerful? But all auspicious qualities are in Krishna.